My name is Ellie Gold. I'm the president of the Gold Institute for International Strategy, a think tank based in Washington, D.C., that focuses on foreign policy and national security uh, issues. Um, today, I, we're going to have what, what is a very, very important conversation. Uh, over the past week, we've uh, been watching uh, events unfold in Minnesota, uh, in Brooklyn, central Minnesota, where uh, a police officer during a routine um, a traffic stop uh, and uh, ended up shooting a, a, a driver of that car. And we'll get through, we'll go into um, what exactly happened. Um, since then, uh, there have been uh, continue, uh, continued calls about uh, systemic racism in, in the police department. There have been riots in uh, Minnesota as well as in other cities in response to this. Um, and I felt that it was very important to have a conversation um, from a, the perspective of law enforcement uh, on what is, what's happened over the past uh, week, what happened during that, that traffic stop. Um, but also, I'm very pleased that we have uh, with, us, uh, with us today as well uh, a colleague um, at the Gold Institute, uh, Congressman Trent Franks. Because while there is a... Uh, um, and there is this uh, perspective from law enforcement that is not necessarily being heard. Um, it, it, we see a lot happening from the political level, whether it's on the state, local, uh, as well as in the Congress. And in fact, um, it was uh, um, uh, the vice president even uh, stepped in on this as well. So um, with that, I, I want to thank everybody for, for, uh, for joining me today. We have with, uh, uh, with us today, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Congressman Trent Franks, uh, um, who did represent the state of uh, his district in Arizona in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, you know, as well, we have uh, Martin Johnson, a uh, Gold Institute senior fellow uh, focusing on law enforcement. And um, we have with us uh, Mark Black as well. Mark uh, is, uh, just recently retired from NYPD um, and also has a unique perspective. So let me quickly uh, go through this. And uh, again, uh, on uh, Sunday, the 11th of April, uh, during a routine traffic stop, the uh, uh, police officer apparently, apparently, uh, uh, accidentally uh, shot a an uncooperative suspect uh, from with uh, during a routine traffic stop. Uh, he had a, a outstanding warrants. They went to uh, uh, to approach him, and uh, um, uh, things apparently got out of hand. What I'm going to ask um, is uh, uh, Martin and Mark, would you give us 60 seconds of, of, of what you have seen from your perspective uh, transpire over the last week or so? Uh, less, it's about almost a week. Uh, Martin, why don't you go first, please? Thank you. Uh, let, me, let me fill in a, a couple of extra details there. Apparently, the driver... Uh, said over the telephone, this is what's been reported, I wasn't there, but uh, said over the to the telephone that he was being pulled over because he had an air freshener hanging from his rear view mirror. Apparently that wasn't the case. The case was that he had expired license plates or there was some kind of a, driver, a uh, license plate uh, illegality going on. So he's pulled over. He's wanted for failure to appear in court for and I don't know the exact charges, but regarding an incident where he took money from somebody by threat of force with a gun. Uh, usually we call that armed robbery. That's what I've heard reported. So once the person is, is uh, uh, advised that they're going to be arrested, they really don't have a right to resist. That's why we have laws against that. You, you don't have a right to resist a lawful arrest. And there's a warrant out for you. A judge said you didn't show up. You need to show up. You didn't bother. I'm going to have your body taken into custody and you're going to have to go through a process uh, to, to rectify that. So rather than simply giving up, saying, oh, OK, I'm under arrest and 
uh, you know, and going with the program, the, uh, the suspect resisted arrest actively. Uh, they tried to convince him to give up. They gave him all kinds of warnings. And it appears that from the audio and the video that I've heard, that one of the officers grabbed the wrong device, that being her uh, actual handgun rather than a taser. And uh, for at least, I, I would say five, 10, 15 seconds, was saying things that was that indicated that she thought she had the taser. That is a, an electrical stunning device designed to get people to cooperate with you or give up, which is what they're supposed to do. Um, so anyway, she accidentally didn't realize it apparently and actually had her handgun, which feels kind of the same, but it's not 100% the same when you're holding it. Uh, and when it was time for her to deploy the taser to make the person give up, uh, she fired and it was actually, it turned out to be her handgun. She fired one shot, immediately understood what had happened. Um, you know, I won't use the words she used, but it's obvious that it was a total accident. Um, did she kill the guy? Yes, she did. Is he dead? Yes, he is. Could it have all been avoided on both their parts? Yes, it could. So that's my perspective on it. it. It's terrible. Nobody, it's a terrible thing that happened. Um, I, I, I'm convinced that it was 100% accidental, uh, that the actual killing of the person was accidental. Mark, you, you've, you've uh, spent uh, decades in, in law enforcement. Uh, you've uh, participated in various different stops throughout your career. Um, from your perspective, do, did you see? Do you see any any malicious intent? Was I mean, based on what we know? Again, this is all based on what we know from the law enforcement perspective. Is there any reason to believe um, that there was, uh, from what we again, from what we've seen, um, racism or anything untoward from that? Uh, 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 law enforcement officer? Well, of course, we don't have, it's still going to be an ongoing investigation. So let's put that into perspective. Sure. And as of right now, um, I don't, uh, we don't see anything that happened. It was, it was a complete accident. As Martin has said, the uh, police officer went for the wrong tool on the tool belt. Now, with that being said, there's something very important here, which the general public does not realize. In law enforcement, there's no such thing as a common car stop. Every car stop can turn into a very volatile situation. And that's where training comes in. With that said, we also don't know what we call the sprint report or the CAD report or the radio communications before the stop to set up the scenario, to set up the incident. That's extremely, extremely important because whenever you're going to do a stop, the police officer wants to know what they're going to get into, whether they're a sing in a single car or whether they're with a partner. That goes even for detectives who might have search warrants who have to go into a home. They want to know what they're getting into. With that being said, car stops and domestic violence incidents tend to be the most volatile incidents a law enforcement professional policing can get themselves involved in. Now, what I find so ironic about this whole situation, um, just to take it a little bit further, is we all have been hearing defund the police. And this incident, if what's the first thing that gets defunded in police departments? Training. And as of all skills in policing, they're perishable. Now, when we talk about perishable skills, we go, I'm talking beyond just going to the range and qualifying on your weapon twice a year or whatever the municipality chooses to do. It's also doing what we did at NYPD, and I'm sure a lot of law enforcement departments do this, we call them felony car stops, where we are listening and we are doing a case scenario where one of the police officers is driving a regular car and then them and their partner might be in a marked car and it could be done, training can be done at night or it can be done during the day. The reason we do this training is to familiarize ourselves of a situation, 
under stress in a safe environment. And one other thing that we have to also understand with policing is, in particularly in this incident and going forward, is the equipment that they're wearing. The amount of weight is on, and each department has their own way of how their police belt, their utility belt, on how, where the different tools that they wear should be placed. And that's also because of mom, uh, muscle memory, becoming familiar with, with what's on your person in case you get into a volatile incident. But I agree wholeheartedly with Martin is what's changed now is it is very hard for a police officer, and we'll go into this later on in the discussion, about compliancy. You are seeing more and more people today starting to challenge the police on the street where before you might have somebody who's compliant. We all want compliancy because it brings down that level of volatility. Sure. And that's when we use our verbiage and everything like that. And then of course, sometimes you can't use compliancy at that point, something very volatile might happen at the end. It becomes safety, not only for the police officer, but the, the civilian population that might be around that incident, as well as for the subject you have to take into custody. I appreciate that, that perspective. Thank you. You know, uh, uh, Congressman, it's, this is, you know, I'm, I'm so thrilled that you're on this call. Typically, when we talk about law, from the perspective of law enforcement, we, we hear from, from our, our colleagues who, are, who represent, who spent time in various different branches of our law enforcement. Um, but the conversation really needs to go, go so much, so much farther. And I'm not even talking about from the legal side. Maybe we should have had an attorney on the call as well. But several days ago, there was a, uh, a press conference in Minnesota. The mayor spoke, the police, of, uh, the, the chief of police spoke, and uh, the, the city, um, the city uh, manager uh, spoke as well. And... Um, the, the immediately the mayor without knowing what happened they watched they watched the video but there were, no investigation was done based on the video and I'm repeating myself based on the video it appeared to be accidental immediately the the mayor called for um, the police officers firing um, ultimately the police officer resigned the uh, but but yet, uh, when the city, when the city manager spoke, he said, "Well, it's still too early. There, we are all entitled to due process, and we have to wait and see what happens before we before we fire anybody." Immediate that evening, the city manager was fired, was relieved of his uh, duty. Um, the uh, ultimately, the chief of police resigned as well. So at what point in time do politicians get in the way? In fact, um, the vice president, Kamala Harris, responded and she, with a tweet saying, prayers are not enough. Uh, Duante Wright should still be with us. While an investigation is underway, our nation needs, to, uh, needs justice and healing. And uh, Duante's family needs to know why their child is dead. The, the, the tone... Of her, uh, of her tweet is incriminating the the law enforcement officer, the police officer, without knowing the facts, the details. Um, as as Martin said, we don't have we don't have the recordings before and after, so we really don't know other than what was seen in that video. What is happening to our the, in the state of policing today, from a political perspective? How is it that those politicians who are here to uphold the law and I don't or to create laws to make sure that that this country is running smoothly, especially the vice president of the United States, to go to an extreme to to make these statements um, for the mayor to fire the 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 city manager and so on what is it what do you see happening from your perspective 
Well, first of all, I, I just uh, say with total sincerity that Mark and Martin's perspective uh, absolutely mirrors my own, uh, only theirs is coming from a, a completely professional point of view from a, a, a background of, of knowledge and experience that I don't think any one of us can, can even come close to, to matching. And I, I just uh, want to express a, a sincere appreciation for these two men because uh, what we underestimate in terms of their importance in society is the whole role of government, the whole purpose of government. You know, we, a long time ago, uh, we, we had enough uh, civilization in our, in our thoughts as a, as a collective human family that we decided, hey, we're not going to let the survival of the fittest be the arbiter uh, of uh, uh, people's rights here. We, we think that there are stronger people out there and some of them are willing to use that strength unfairly to completely ignore the rights of others. So as a, as a group of people, we will get together as a, as a family and we will create this thing called government that says that uh, we know there's two types of law, really there's the, the rule of men and the rule of law, really there are two types of rule. And um, once we come to the conclusion that the rule of law is what we're going to adhere to, then we need those people that are willing to put themselves between the malevolent and the innocent in order to maintain that. And I believe that they are the most noble uh, figures in our society, even, even more than the clergy, more than, I, I just feel like those who put themselves at risk, their lives on the line for people they don't even know should have society's most uh, uh, sincere gratitude and, and uh, just their honor. We should honor them tremendously because, you know, the, the, the Bible says, Jesus said, he said, greater love hath no man than this. The man lay down his life for his friends. And yet these law enforcement officers go beyond that. They put their lives at risk for people they don't know, not just their friends, but for people they have never even heard of. And I, I couldn't help but, but remember, um, uh, a news item I saw the other day, a young man in New Mexico, I used to live there, so I think it was especially uh, uh, real to me. I was a, a young uh, patrolman, I had family, children, um, had pulled this person over and the guy continued to sort of um, hesitate and he, uh, the patrolman walked around on the driver's side door and asked him to roll down the window, exhibited the most kind and decent uh, uh, interaction with this man, only to, in a few moments where the guy got out, the guy had no, had no indication that the guy was going to, to be violent, but the guy got out and shot him in the head with a rifle. And uh, the patrolman, you know, gave his life there, just trying to make a, a, better, a better world. So uh, I just think that this thing is not just a small issue. This is not just about the political willingness of the left to throw the most noble figures in human society under the bus. It's not just about that, that's bad enough, but this is about undermining the very purpose of government in the first place. And if we don't uh, afford our law enforcement uh, officers, not only that qualified immunity that we talk about, that special recognition that they have a tough job and that they're put in, in an enormously difficult position all the time. Uh, if, we, if we somehow are willing to sacrifice it all for a little political porridge, as it were, uh, and we're willing to throw these guys under the bus, uh, I just think it uh, has absolutely enormous implications for all of society. And then I'll just, I'll just end it with this, uh, my, my thoughts here with this. The, uh, the city manager that said, you know, after all, they have due process. You would have thought that this man had heralded a new type of heresy. Uh, he was quoting the Constitution is what he was doing. Uh, the very foundation uh, of what we say is the, is the ultimate uh, uh, reference of our rule of law in this country. It says, you know, we, if we could put the, I used to chair the Constitution subcommittee in Congress. And if you could put the, 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 the Constitution really in one sentence or two, it would be, that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And that's what the, the manager was expressing. And for him to lose his job over that 
is a disgrace that uh, further beggars my ability to articulate. Let me ask you this, uh, Congressman, and uh, I, I, I sadly, here is a conversation that is meant to be one of uh, intellectual uh, pursuit uh, is going to be, naturally is going to be uh, downgraded to uh, political uh, discourse, um, <laughs> it, which is, what do you see, I mean, as you just said, you, cha you chaired the Constitution Subcommittee and what do you see happening within government today? I'm not talking about law enforcement. Law enforcement is one aspect of a larger government, but what do you see happening today, whether it's in Washington or in Minnesota, um, to government when you have elected officials who are here to, uh, uh, to support the constitution, to defend the constitution? Um, what does that, what does that t tell you uh, when you see what's happening? Well, you know, first of all, let me just say that my time in Congress was uh, the greatest honor of my life. And I will always be uh, thankful to God and my fellow human beings for giving me that opportunity. Uh, having said that, my greatest heartbreak, and there were numerous ones, but my greatest heartbreak uh, in serving in Congress is to discover that truth has been disinvited from the discourse. The truth itself no longer holds the sway that it once did. Now, the fact is truth always prevails. Uh, just because we ignore it doesn't mean that it won't have the last word, it certainly will. But unfortunately, um, we've gone from a society that used to debate what was right, and now it's always who was right. And the word right doesn't automatically have to coincide with the word truth or justice. And it really, desperately concerns me because not only have we become a, a polarized society, I mean, where we're just completely at opposite it, it ends with each other, where we have a different uh, goal um, in mind entirely. So it's kind of hard to share the cab ride as it were. Uh, but we've, uh, we've come to a conclusion where the one side uh, gets a lot of uh, criticism for not having new ideas because we believe that these basic uh, constitutional foundations are still valid today. And then on the left where they've completely, uh, completely vitiated the constitution. Uh, you know, the, the whole idea, the whole predicate for a constitution says that we've all come to the conclusion that this is our, this is our agreement, that this is what we're going to live by. This is our rule of law. And uh, we so believe that that we will pay people and we will honor them and we will uh, recognize them to be officers of, of enforcing that constitution. That's a big deal. And when we throw under the bus, the very people that uh, step forward in that noble pursuit, we throw the rule of law itself under the bus and we put all of humanity at the door of complete tyranny and uh, uh, just where the, the light of human compassion has gone out of the survival of the fittest prevails over humanity. It's a very serious situation. And uh, uh, my greatest heartbreak is to see members of Congress, those that stand on the floor of the United States Congress and swear allegiance to the US Constitution that they will defend and, and, and protect that, that Constitution from enemies foreign and domestic. And they'll stand there and completely throw it under the bus because there's some little political advantage they think they might have. And I'll tell you, it tells me, and I go on the record and I'll say this to the whole world, that the left in America has become the enemy of humanity. I once said that about a particular president, uh, that his, he's become, uh, his, his policies have become an enemy of humanity. But the left now has embraced that in a whole sense. And I think it represents the most extreme danger to our country. And I pray that people wake up and I'm just, just an end thought here. I think that they are. If you look just in the last, I think it's the last four months, um, uh, support for black life, trust in black life, trust is the word, trust in black lives matter has plummeted uh, and, and trust in the, the law enforcement has increased. So I just hope these two officers and, and all of their contemporaries uh, will hold to the notion that the people love you and they were grateful to God for you and we honor you 
and uh, this Black Lives nonsense, and I'm talking about that Black Lives Matter as, a, as an organization. We believe uh, as Americans that every life matters. And I know that that just enrages the left when you say every life matters, but that's too damn bad. We believe that every life matters and that's the whole purpose for our country, you know, that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. That is the foundational core cornerstone of our country. And for us to uh, completely toss that aside at the whim uh, of uh, political expediency is an outrage. And, and I believe the American people are starting to understand it. Uh, God help us if uh, things happen that we can't regain the, the uh, reins of some sort of, of um, uh, civilization again. Uh, Congressman, you, you brought up a, a, a number of really uh, important points. Um, all lives matter, um, including the unborn as well. Um, but, you know, Mark, let me, let, 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 let me go to you. I, I, I wanted to ask you about New York and New York City in particular. I say New York City because you have the, uh, New York has currently is the largest uh, police force possibly in the world um, and hopefully it will stay that way. Um, but recently uh, New York has uh, chosen to get rid of uh, qualified immunity. Um, we see uh, a mayor whose uh, uh, who's affinity for, the, for law enforcement is less than stellar um, and What's just what is happening in New York, and I, I, I and if we take a look at, at, at what happened in Minnesota, and let's let's use that. What are the ramifications moving across the country to New York? What are the ramifications, and what are some of the concerns that I'm talking about practical? I'm not talking about theoretical or this could be, this could happen. Realistically, straightforward, practically speaking. What are the ramifications from Minnesota uh, to New York? So I uh, basically have been out of law enforcement now for less than a year. So I was there during the, the riots in, in New York City. And New York City is not unique in taking away qualified immunity. Colorado, I believe now, and also uh, New Mexico as well. So let's go back to when I was what we call on the job and working. There was a mad sprint to the door for people to leave the NYPD, all right? Now, take, take qualified immunity, guarantee you will be seeing a stampede to go to the door. What does that mean? What that means that people are leaving the job, they're leaving the profession, all right? They're leaving the profession in, in, in law enforcement. And I don't think it's just germane to New York City. I believe that speaking to friends who are in law enforcement in other municipalities, this is something that's going up across the United States. So you asked about ramification, all right? Mm -hmm. So several ramifications will be happening and they're happening right now. As I once alluded to before in our previous discussion, there's something we call the brain drain, all right? We need mentors. Mentorship, this is a vocation, sure. this is a vocation. People need to learn from mentors. Everybody's replaceable. But what you want for the next uh, generation of law enforcement is that mentor that has insight, knowledge on how to do specific jobs within the department to instill that insight with the, with the generation that he's leaving behind. And a mentor doesn't mean just for people who are rookies. I mean, I went to some very sophisticated units such as computer crimes, arson explosion squad, and what have you. You can be an old salt on the job and you're gonna need a mentor who knows these, these, things, these sort of technical investigations. Once you lose that, you pretty much lost your police department. I don't care how much money you throw, it, throw at it, you lose it. The second thing is, now we go up to qualified immunity, is what is going to happen here? This is for qualified immunity, basically for civil service employees. Um, something very interesting is happening here. But, uh, Mark, let me interrupt you for a moment. Can you take a, a moment just to say what is qualified immunity? Basically, it's for certain protections, and we'll use it for law enforcement, mm -hmm. where the municipality will come to the defense of that person uh, during some, uh, some sort of civil complaint, um, whether it's providing 
um, um, uh, uh, damages or whether it's providing uh, defense costs and what have you. Does that mean that if that does that mean if police officer Joe gets sued, it, it, it's now the responsibility of the of the, the police department? Yeah, and they'll have some some identification. Okay. Now listen, I'm not talking from the perspective of a bad police officer, a bad apple. That goes all out the window, and and you know pretty much. What happens is here now is it's a very slippery slope, which the general public doesn't realize this. You have now created, and I've spoken to my former uh, colleagues who are still active, you've gone to inactive policing. Now, it doesn't make a difference if you're an investigator or you're a patrolman. Because of this, no law enforcement professional is going to risk their mortgage, is going to risk their kids' education, is going to risk their livelihood of putting on handcuffs to get compliancy, and then all of a sudden, someone's going to start suing them civilly, even though they had probable cause for arrest. Let's go back to this, how this really gets into the, a little bit into the weeds on this. As a former law enforcement, and Martin, jump in on this, we can arrest on what we call probable cause, all right? Probable is probable. Not that it, probable cause based on what was said, seen, or evidentiary. So let's say you pick the crime, you pick the, the incident. I arrest this individual, I put him in cuffs. Right there, I've taken them into custody. I go through the arrest process. I fingerprint them, write up the complaint, take a witness statement, whatever it might be. And then they go through the, the system where they'll get up to arraignment where the judge basically is there to explain the charges that this individual has. Everything's done by the book. For this hypothetical, everything's done by the book. The case then is presented to the prosecutor. We call them assistant district attorneys here in New York City. And all of a sudden they say, no, DP. DP means decline prosecution. Uh-oh, that opens up a Pandora's box. That subject now is gonna start suing the individual officer. Without qualified immunity, who's gonna back up that officer? Right. Why would anybody wanna go into law enforcement today in a, in a community that took away qualified immunity? And I'll take it one step further. This slippery slope can even lead into to other first responders. It doesn't have to be just police. What about for instance, I have another hypothetical. Your fire department decides to put a paramedic on a tactical team who's tactically trained to do tactical, basically combat medic work because they're going to a high risk area. You take qualified, everyone who hit the door who's in policing, they don't have qualified immunity, but the fireman does or that individual does. Are they gonna in return later on, are our leaders in government gonna say, well, now we're gonna take away from fire. EMS, paramedics, where does it stop? Where does it stop? And another thing that's really, really interesting about this, which the bigger picture, you're gonna lose your tax base. Why? If you don't have proactive policing, that is telling the criminals, it's a free for all. Who is going to want to invest in the community that's not safe and secure, and can have be vibrant with a sustainable tax base. The, 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 the tax base that's living in the upper middle class, wealthy areas, pretty much are respecting their police officers. Do they really have to worry? Directly, no, but indirectly, yes. Because if crime starts to leak out of the major metropolitan areas, it will seep into suburbia, which people don't realize this. Crime is like water. It wants the path of least resistance. So between defunding the police and taking away qualified immunity, which is starting to happen in some municipalities, this is opening up a Pandora's box. And once that box is open and you start to lose mentors, qualified law enforcement, and you don't have good retention rates within the ranks of your department, you basically are looking for serious civil unrest. And this is not a corrective action where money could be thrown at it. This is something that systemically 
Both sides either have to come together and talk about this, the liberal, conservative, whoever it is, in a common sense and applicable way for policing. This is very interesting. Thank you, Mark. I mean, uh, Martin, you travel the country training local law enforcement. I know that you're from Howard County, Maryland. You, that was where you spent your time in law enforcement, uh, both as a detective as well as um, uh, uh, a beat. It was, it's in the, I don't, you're not called beat cops anymore, but as a, <laughs> a, a, a police officer. Um, what do you, in Maryland, um, Maryland just uh, just voted out the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights. Um, you know, Mark's talking about this from from the perspective of a of the most major metropolitan area we have in this country, New York. But what do you see going on across the country? You know, does this impact? Does this impact the smaller areas? As just as much as, as as New York, what do you see happening? And also, in particular, what do you see happening in in Maryland now that uh, the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights um, was uh, gotten rid of? Yeah, well, I, I can tell you, not in not in my old police department, but I know in another law enforcement agency in Maryland. And I just talked with somebody uh, two days ago who said that uh, as soon as this repeal of the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, which essentially protected the constitutional rights of police officers who were doing their jobs. Uh, as soon as that passes, uh, and it did pass, uh, it'll go to, um, uh, it'll become law in October. Uh, I know of seven members of one agency who put in their papers to retire and they're not waiting for October, they're going now. They don't even want to take a chance. They're, they're saying, you know, my, my government, my elected officials are taking away some of my protections. Uh, they want me to do this very difficult and unusual job and take on unusual responsibilities. And then they're going to take away my unusual protections and, and some of my usual protections as well. So they are, uh, some are leaving. Uh, I'll tell you, I, I spoke on... Um, uh, Monday with somebody who is uh, considering becoming a law enforcement officer. Uh, she is 23 years old. She's extremely bright. I think she's very well cut out for the job, uh, but I discouraged her. Uh, I, and I never thought I would do that. After 37 years in the law enforcement business, I never thought I'd discourage anybody. And I've encouraged dozens, uh, some of whom I even got to train later as officers who actually did get hired. So I discouraged her from getting into the business right now. Um, I, I suggested some other related fields. Um, so there is a hesitation now, not on everybody's part, but at least on more than before, in my opinion, um, to get involved, to get into the job. Uh, listen, cops don't get into it for the money, sure. okay? Um, there isn't enough money in it for what you're putting on the line. Um, so it, it's, it's what I used to call a calling. It, it's, you know, you get it, you get it into your blood and, and it's there and you not, you can't fight it. You know, I, I couldn't fight wanting to become a police officer, uh, starting in 1978 and I was, uh, hired in 1983. Um, so uh, hesitation to get in the job, those who are in saying goodbye, my government is turning its back on me. Uh, after they've asked me to do some really tough stuff and make some millisecond decisions on whether somebody gets hurt, including me, uh, I don't need this. And, and I can't blame them. You know, we, Mark and Martin um, and I, along with a couple of our other colleagues, are working on a project uh, to how to preempt or prevent um, uh, attacks on houses of worship, uh, anti-Semitic attacks, and so on. And that's a topic for a different conversation. But um, Mark, Martin, and I want, I'm, I'm, I'm posing this question to both of you, and Congressman, feel free to jump in with any questions if you want something clarified. This is, at this point in time, I would really like this to be a conversation that we have, uh, three of us, uh, four of us sitting around. Um, 
how does what's happening today um, with a qualified immunity, a law enforcement bill of rights, um, what's happening in Minnesota, et cetera, how is that going to impact the project that we're working on? Is this something where we say, you know what, we're not going to get involved. We're going to stay as we did, which is we'll, we'll clean up the mess after it happens, but we're not going to get involved because remember, when we talk about houses of worship or any any demographic group, whether it's whether it's the LGBTQ communities, whether it's uh, Jews, Muslims, Christians, it makes no difference, right? It's not worth it because I'm not interested in be call, be call, being called an anti-Semite, a, a, a racist, a, a xenophobe. It's not worth it for me to go through that. How is what we see today going to impact the types of projects that we're working on? Martin, Mark, take your pick. Well, I think it's all going to first come down to once again, um, I, this, what we're going through is going to change the priorities of policing. And, um, the reason I say that is the individual communities throughout the United States are going to have to decide what do they want from their police? That's going to be the bottom line to all, all this. Do they want them to be inactive or proactive? Okay. And that will determine the type of efficiency and effectiveness the police department will then become. All right. Also, because of this, you're going to have manpower issue, significant manpower issue, because retention rates will not be able to keep up with the amount of people who are leaving departments uh, that, that that's going to happen. So in your question, for instance, we'll just use the example houses of worship. All right. New York City, we have a lot of houses of worship. We have parades in the summer every single weekend. Well, who's going to protect those parades? Where are you going to get the manpower? Where, what about units that might have to be closed up? What, what's going to happen? And this is not something you can throw money at. This has to be a systemic change from that community where the police department is. And the citizen of that police department, through their vote, will determine whether that police department is going to be active or inactive. And that will determine the type of policing that they want. That's the bottom line to all this discussion. But I propose something else to you on a, on a different level, and I'll end with this. We talk about policy a lot, a lot about policy. I have yet to see an investigative reporter or anybody from DC ask why. Why are police leaving? And someone really has to determine and go out there and touch the, the patrolman and the detective who's actually doing the work, not the police commissioner, not the chief of police, the actual person who's doing the vocation from the East Coast to the West Coast to the Midwest to the North and South and ask the why. Because once you find the common denominator, then it's gonna be very easy to counter all that's going on with the fund of police and also with taking away qualified immunity. That case, once presented to our elected officials, if they back away from, from that, those sort of facts, then you know there's something, something systemically wrong in government right there and then with respect to policing. Right. And, and that's what we need to really look in because there is a common denominator all over the United States that's starting to happen with inside policing, but no investigative reporter has picked up on it. No, nobody in DC is, doing, is looking at this. So someone has to find out the why, because wouldn't it be kind of interesting if a police officer in New York and Boston and someplace, let's say in Salt Lake City are all leaving, totally different dynamics, different communities, and it, but there's one underlying common denominator, that is something very, very powerful to bring to our elected officials. Yeah, is, uh, Martin, uh, Martin? Yeah, I was just, let me add just a little bit to what Mark said, and, and he had asked rhetorically before, where does the elimination of qualified immunity end? Mm. Um, and it just makes me think, let, let me see, which prosecutors, which judges, uh, which government officials who are making executive decisions or lawmakers, which of them is ready to give up their qualified immunity as well as take it away from the police? It's not going to happen. You know, wh where is it going to stop, Mark? 
It's going to stop. It's going to stop when it hits an elected official or a judge. That, that's where it's going to stop. Oh, no, you can't take my qualified immunity. Now, I want to be open to civil suits because I let somebody go back on the street uh, who was a dangerous criminal and they killed somebody and their family, that family of the victim is now coming to sue me, which can't happen now because they have their own form of qualified immunity. So the, the police are an easy target. The police are an easy target. And, and as, as the congressman said, that, you know, he was talking about how the, the, the big framework of government, people in the United States are contacted by their government more frequently through the police than anything else. I have yet to have a, 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 tax, uh, a tax person, a person from the IRS come to my door or come to my car accident or stop me on the street or tell me, hey, you know what? You got flat tire back here. Did you know that? It's the police. And so we are, we are the face of government. And that, that's just something that we need to, to the, the uh, officials, uh, you know, the, these decision makers need to, to bear in mind, we're it. You know, we are the number one face of government to, to our citizens and visitors and other people who are here. So it's, it's totally different. It's a totally different job. And uh, you, you really have to experience it or spend a lot of time with somebody and learn about it before, uh, and I hate to say it, but before some, not all, some politicians uh, decide to not resist the impulse to make quick comments about things. Um, just, it, it drives me crazy when they do. Uh, I, I would no more tell my surgeon how to perform surgery or second guess my surgeon than, or my pilot than then these people should be second guessing the police prematurely, right. prematurely. And to jump out into the news or social media, whatever it might be, with these grand pronouncements or snide comments or perhaps simply innocent uh, comments that are just premature uh, is abhorrent. Uh, six days ago, Sergeant James Smith of the Iowa State Patrol was killed by a bad guy. A bad guy purposely killed this police officer, this, this state trooper doing his job, trying to apprehend this violent criminal. I'll have to check Twitter, but I don't know if that a notation about that happened. And, and there's something very interesting that, you, that Martin brings up here. We keep bringing up that it's a vocation or a calling, all right? Right. With the people, with the retention rates now that are going to be challenged within the departments, what we don't want to see in policing is a workfare program. You want people who are highly motivated in policing or in law enforcement in general. And if it just becomes a place where someone can just hang up their coat and take a paycheck, you're not gonna get efficient and effective policing. And we don't wanna see become a workfare program. We wanna see it that these mem members of the service are there because they have a, a duty to community. They feel they have the duty to community or you know, the challenge of doing a, a specific type of investigation. Um, you want somebody who's going to be, to be there um, to protect, serve, and once again, from the political perspective, protect the tax base. If that tax base leaves the community, that community spirals down. Right. So Congressman, you know, oh, sorry, go ahead if you have a comment. Please go ahead. So I just, you know, Martin made the comment um, about the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights where, where all of a sudden the law enforcement individual's constitutional rights are at risk. You know, all too often in, in, in government, in our society today, when we have issues, whether it's from the whether it's regarding elections or whether it's regarding taxes or whatever it is, we never repeal old laws. We just tack on new ones. But in reality, if only the original laws were followed, we would never have had the problem to begin with. And we don't need new laws to solve the problems. We just need to adhere to the old laws. 
at what point in time does law enforcement, does a member of Congress, does a president, does anyone have different rules and laws, constitutionally I'm talking about, than the next guy? We are all the same. So it goes back to, it goes back to the, the, the idea, uh, and I'm not talking about qualified immunity. There's, you know, certain, certain, um, th that's just a nuance within, I don't, that's not a constitution, that, that's not constitutionality I'm talking about. But where does it, what's happening where, where we have one constitution and one set of laws for one class of people and we have another for another class. Now, now, <laughs> present company excluded, we have, we have a whole group of people in Washington that laws, that there are certain laws that apply to them and certain laws that apply to everybody else. What, is, what do we see happening today more so than ever before, has this just been, have we been spiraling? Um, what needs to happen to bring us back to that constitutional base that we have, to, uh, that we've had for it's a couple hundred years now? Well, first of all, uh, again, I've enjoyed the discussion here tremendously. Uh, I think all of us, at least in this panel, would agree that one of the foundational legitimacies of the rule of law is that it is applied equally, that each person is equal under the law, that the janitor and the senator uh, have uh, an equal place under the law, under its protections, under its uh, uh, corrections, wh whatever it might be. And uh, I think that's vitally important. And we are entering into an age of, of uh, duplicity in that regard, where we have essentially two entirely different uh, justice, uh, uh, at least ideologies, uh, where, um, a, as you mentioned, Martin, the, the young man that was killed, we don't hear much about that. We hear all about the things that fit into the, to the left-wing narrative and almost never into the conservative narrative. The conservatives have always had a, a, a very significant advantage. And Mark, you mentioned it perfectly, and that is that uh, reality always kind of has the last word. You know, when, when uh, I served on the Armed Services Committee for a long time, and one of the things that we could always point out is that the most important component for the productivity of a nation was a secure environment, uh, was uh, to be able to, to know that, you know, people invested in America, that, that we were secure, that some other country wasn't going to take us over. And so there was a tremendous value in having a good security apparatus and a strong national security. And it's the same thing that's true of New York City. Um, the, the thing that helps that, that city thrive is a secure environment where people feel secure and without, uh, without a police presence, they can't. That's just a reality. But no matter what we as conservatives do, that's going to uh, assert itself uh, in a very dramatic way. But in a way, I think the most significant point that can be made here, uh, Martin, you made it, and Mark, you, you, uh, you repeated it. And that is that law enforcement is a sense of calling. I don't know how in the world we could overemphasize the importance of that. Because most officers, I mean, the ones that I've, that I've known, they do consider it a calling. And there's something in the human soul that says, okay, uh, I know this life is a miracle and I wanna do what I can uh, for my fellow human beings in a way that will honor the God that I serve. And uh, I am deeply convinced that whether they're soldiers or police officers, that the protectors in our society are motivated by that more than anything else. Uh, it's true that they don't get paid what they should get paid. And then they not only have to take on the reality of life and death uh, in the streets, but then they have to have the very people that are ostensibly the ones commissioning them to do those work, works, pushing a knife in them from behind uh, from the august uh, high echelons of government. And it is just absolutely uh, a treachery that 
that is beyond my ability to describe. And so uh, the, the challenge that we have is very real. And I think what we have to do is, is as conservatives is to reassert the noble position that we honor those who put themselves at risk for us. We honor those that, that have a calling that puts aside so many other things that they could pursue selfishly for the sake, once again, of protecting the innocent, for them being willing to stand between the innocent and the malevolent at the risk of their own lives. There's something incredibly poignant about it, of, uh, of it in, a, in a real sense. And I think that in the long run, uh, we have to make sure that we project that to the point that it prevails again in our society. And I, and I do believe, uh, as both these gentlemen have said, that in time, uh, reality will explain that to everyone because there's, you know, there's nothing that uh, blows up a left-wing ideolo uh, ideologue more than uh, to watch their sometimes ridiculous ideologies be totally destroyed by an unruly set of facts. Uh, over time, the truth will prevail. Truth and time travel on the same road. It's just that God help us to be able to articulate this uh, before more people have to suffer because that's the bottom, bottom, bottom line. It's, it's about the, which policies uh, protect the innocents, which policies uh, pers uh, will uh, promote life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What are those things that allow people to lay hold on the miracle of life? Uh, and uh, the, the good news, we're on the right side. And the good news is there are still noble people like Mark and Martin uh, out there that have, will follow their example to, to protect the innocent and to recognize Life is the gift of God that it is. Uh, uh, Congressman, you, you and I have been working uh, together for you know upwards of 10 years now. Um, for me from the outside while you were on Capitol Hill, um, and now I, I am blessed to have you with us at the uh, Gold Institute as well. And one thing that I knew and that, that I've always known about you is you're going to say it's straightforward. So I'm going to ask you this question, and this will be my final question to you, um, although I will end it with everybody having the opportunity to comment on someone else, if you so choose. But I'm going to ask you this question. With the direction and the trajectory that we see uh, government go, and government, I mean, everything, everybody other than law enforcement, I'm talking about specifically lawmakers, on all levels. What do we as a society have to do in order, from your perspective, in order to bring lawmakers back on track where, I'm not suggesting what the law is, what the law must be, but in order to treat everybody equally, that's, that is giving the due process to law enforcement the same way that they expect due process for the uh, 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 for the civilian, um, the way that 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 laws apply just like to the civilian as it does to the lawmaker as well. What do you see from your perspective, from your experience in government, to both uh, both on the state and national level, um, to bring government back on track? Wow, well, that's an easy question. Um, I, I guess the, the, the first thing I would say is to remember that the, it's the water on the inside of the ship that sinks it. And um, one of the great uh, heartaches that I used to, uh, that I've said earlier today is the fact that truth seems to be disinvited. But part of that equation is that those people who ostensibly were the ones that uh, wanted to purvey truth have gotten pretty uh, uh, timid about it all. Uh, police officers have to face a very hard reality. They have to, that's why they have a gun. That's why they, they, they face the reality. And the least those of us in public policy can do is to have the same attitude towards being able to face evil ideologies and to call them out for what they are. There comes a time when we have to say, you know what, uh, Mr. McConnell, I, I don't wanna mention names, but you have to stand up and fight evil. You can't stand there and just 
uh, try to make it sound like you're all august and, and, and have all of these uh, uh, noble uh, uh, positions, but never willing to fight. And uh, our greatest trap challenge, I saw it many times in Congress, is that while we faced an evil on the part of the left that was absolutely real and stark and stunning, well, most of the time the reason we lost is because we weren't willing to stand up there and get in the mud and slug it out with them and call, it, call them out for what they were. And I, I have to say to you, I didn't mean to get this uh, into this area about Trump, but I believe that Trump's, one of his greatest attributes was his willingness to call evil and nonsense for what it was. Now, he was not the best one to articulate that sometimes, and sometimes he, uh, you know, didn't speak a word of diplomat. But the point is, he was willing to stand up and call the left ideology for what it was, and that is a treacherous, duplicitous, duplicitous ideology that was antithetical to everything America stands for. And uh, he was willing to get in their face. And sometimes we have to do that. We have to be willing to get up and, and speak the truth, whatever it is. And sometimes that's not easy to do because it means you're going to, to take a lot of uh, uh, hits and sometimes they're going to be fatal. But uh, I just believe that, uh, that there's, a, there's a quote that I, I think probably gives me my best uh, exit here. And it says, let all the ends that you aim at in life be your countries, your gods, and the truth. Be noble, and the noblest that lies in other men, sleeping but never dead, will rise in majesty to meet thine own. And I think if we stand forward and project a noble ideal, a noble philosophy, and that part of that philosophy is calling evil for what it is, if we will do that, I think somehow in the long run, the truth will begin to sort of seep back into the hearts and souls of collective humanity and uh, that we'll have an opportunity to see truth and freedom uh, and walking in the sunshine of, of freedom for a little longer. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and Martin, from your perspective, what do you see um, we need to do in order to, for law enforcement uh, to, to, for us to start feeling um, that uh, the comfort or the security uh, for law enforcement to, to, to come back as strong as it once was. Law enforcement individuals to feel comfortable to come back um, as, as they once were. Right. Well, you need to know that your government, that your, your leadership has got your back. People make mistakes. We get that. Honest mistakes can be made, but when when as is happening occasionally now, we see it when an event occurs, when a law enforcement officer is involved and there might be something that went wrong or, you know, on the officer's part, or maybe not at all, they're being hung out to dry to begin with, just right off the bat. You know, nobody's waiting. If, if, we, if we looked at an airplane crash, where a terrible thing happened, it might have been pilot error, but it might not. And we said, you know what? Pilot's got to go. Pilot's got to get fired. Pilot's got to go to court. Pilot's got to, in fact, you know what? The hell with court. Let's just hang the pilot. Yeah. Let's hang the pilot and the family. It, we cannot jump quickly. We need to look at these things methodically. And nobody wants to do that better. Nobody wants to do that more efficiently and accurately than the police themselves. Right. Trust me on this. Nobody wants a dirty cop. You don't want them. We don't want them. And that's why we've had internal affairs divisions. That's why we've had police investigations and officers. And that's why we try to weed out the less than one-tenth of one percent, less than one-tenth of one percent of bad cops who are uh, members of police departments, sheriff's offices, or other investigatory bodies. So we need to know that our leadership will be measured, take a breath, see what happened. If we need correction, correct us. If it's a bad cop, get, let's get rid of them. Let's prosecute them if they broke a law. But we need to know that we're not going to have these jump, snap decisions. And when we're second-guessed, we need to be second-guessed by qualified people. Here, look, for instance, the, in Maryland, 
my legislature just eliminated the law enforcement officers bill of rights which we talked about they didn't just take that out but they substituted something else it's a police accountability act so one of the things that's in there is that there is a complaint against police board that is put together with the the membership of that board is proscribed somebody who can't be on that board is any police officer so if we were to have a medical accountability board for all the doctors in maryland and if a complaint came in about a doctor doing something bad and it was going to be investigated and determined whether that doctor was going to be charged or dismissed or you know whatever the disposition is going to be if we had a medical a doctor's advisory board would we make sure that there wasn't a single doctor on that board? Probably not. But this is what this legislature has done. So, it, you know, I can't cover the, the entire topic or, or we'd be here all, all week. But we, law enforcement officers need to know that when they go out and do their job as honestly and as well as they possibly can, there is recognition that they might make a mistake. I made a mistake. I made a couple of mistakes while I was working for 25 years as an officer. I learned from them. They weren't worth firing me over. Uh, you know, they were honest mistakes. You know, they involved crashes, but that's the way it goes. Um, I managed to crash my own patrol car. Don't want to talk about it. But uh, the uh, but the thing is that we need to know that our leadership is going to back us up, look at things carefully, and then I'm going to be a whole lot more willing. When I see that expired tag, when I see that possibly stolen car, when I see that guy on the street who keeps reaching over towards his right side under his jacket, that's what I need to know in the back of my mind when I decide whether I'm going to take action or not. Because if not, as Mark alluded to, you're going to have not proactive, barely reactive, and inactive police. And when you have that, like taking apart a gun squad, a, an illegal street gun squad, Shootings go way up. I'll be darned. One hundred percent. Thank you. Um, and Mark, uh, what what are your thoughts on this? What are, what are your thoughts on uh, the uh, what what police officers or law enforcement needs to see before you feel comfortable enough to rebuild uh, the departments? Well, I think the 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 first step is as martin stated is that the community has to get behind the police okay and then into the 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 common sense approach with the politicians and the policies that they want to put forward common sense is the magic word here the next thing that i think really has to be done is we don't see a lot of people uh investigative journalists or uh from a lot of different uh research foundations doing the real type of in-depth studies on policing and what's really happening today, today with the police. So as I alluded to, is what's the common denominator of police leaving throughout, leaving the profession, the vocation throughout the United States? Believe it or not, that, get, that on a national level trickles down all the way down to local policing because by then the argument of the why they're leaving will open up different avenues of discussion which are just not for law enforcement to ponder on, but also to expand on how policy is set. And that's extremely important. What you have now is a lack of morale in a lot of, a lot of uh, departments. And what Martin is alluding to is a morale crisis. That's why everybody's running for the door right now in law enforcement. And that's why former law enforcement, such as Martin and myself, would never say go into this vocation right now. Absolutely not. There's just no way I would even tell my my child to go into it or friends, children to go into it. Definitely not. Definitely not. And not until, and, and not until there is some levity in the conversation of what, what does the community expect from their police force with respect to apprehending criminals. And as Martin said, which is very, very true, is that policing is government. If you have a division within your government, you're never going to be able to bring the people together in a conversation. And what we have here is a lot of large police forces 
have no more confidence in their upper management because the upper management is towing the political rhetoric in their local uh, uh, um, town halls. I cannot tell you when upper management in a police force is not backing up their police officers, what a morale breaker that is. And unfortunately, police officers, at least in New York City, we can't, we can't protest, Taylor Law, we can't. But what you're seeing, what's worse than the protest is people leaving for the door. And that is worse than people saying, I'm, I'm gonna call in sick, or I'm just not gonna do my job today and stay inside in the precinct. They are actually leaving for the door. So the question to the politicians that I have, what are you gonna do for law enforcement to bring up the morale? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do to protect the people who are protecting your residents, your small businesses, your large businesses, and your tax base how are you gonna attract future generations to live in your cities or your counties with anti-police rhetoric and taking away things like qualified immunity and defunding the police, which then means defunding what? Training, which means what are you gonna have? A higher, a higher liability threshold now? Because that young officer who's just coming on went for the wrong tool on the tool belt and wasn't trained properly or enough during the year? I asked the politicians that question. And then I asked the question to the voters, because that's the proximate cause where all this starts. The voters are responsible and accountable what's happening in their communities. Not the police, the voters. If you're gonna, it's like a computer. Garbage in, garbage out. We've all heard that. Good in, good out. If you're gonna vote for someone who believes in these policies, then expect that that's what you're gonna have in your communities from policing. Right. You can't blame the police force. We're a reflection of what the citizen has voted for through their representative. <laughs> That's the bottom line. So I go back to how is the politician going to bring back the local politicians, going to, going to bring back morale so there's efficient, effective policing. And I, once you have that, you will see a police force then that becomes proactive and efficient. No, excellent. Thank you. Now Mark, do you have a final comment? Yeah, let, let me just add, that, and let me echo a little bit and just add uh, to what Mark said about what the community standards are and, and community backing. Uh, what A lot of what we're talking about isn't happening in every single community in the United States, right. okay? So, uh, you know, the things we see that are on fire and, you know, going on, it's not happening everywhere. It's very serious and we need to pay attention to it because we don't want that cancer to spread. Uh, but, and... I don't, uh, I, I, my, I, I'll just tell you, my, my area, my community, 253 square miles of the whole planet, uh, Howard County, Maryland, Gray County, I live here, I pay high taxes to be able to live here, I'm good with it. Uh, our community, as an example of what I'm saying, our community overwhelmingly supports law enforcement, be it my police department, my former police department, or the sheriff's office here. My community, the people who live here, and as Mark says, the taxpayers, the folks who live here, work here, visit here, they overwhelmingly support the police. And the police feel that. The officers feel that. We also have good leadership. So it's not, I'm not, I don't suggest for a second that leadership is absent everywhere. Leadership seems to be absent in a couple of places that I've seen over the last few months, but not every place is like that. Yeah, so my, I don't I don't see um, uh, my former department suffering as much of uh, officers uh, second guessing their careers as we will see in other places. And uh, the seven I alluded to earlier, the seven people who I know are leaving are not from my former police department; it's from another agency. But nevertheless, so th there is a big difference depending on where you are, just like with everything else. There's a big difference depending on where you are. But if you have good community support and you've got good, strong leadership, and we're blessed with that here, then you're going to make out a whole lot better. And your community, what's the bottom line? The community will be safer. The less fortunate, the weaker among us, they will be safer uh, when the, the police are there to protect them for those who would take advantage. I think the bottom line here, first of all, I thank you all for your, for your comments. I think this is an important discussion to have. I think it's important uh, that people really understand from, 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 from the law enforcement perspective, 
um, what's happening and what is going on within what we can speculate is going on within that police department in Minnesota, but what we actually see happening is across the country. Uh, Mark, you talk about New York. New York certainly has had um, its own share of issues, whether it's riots, uh, peaceful protests, or parades. At the end of the day, New York has had it, but then again, you take a look at, at other communities like, like Martin's in uh, Howard County, Maryland, and uh, the dynamics are very different over there. So, so what you see on television, you know, the old television line, if it bleeds, it leads. That doesn't mean that, that the entire United States is on fire. Um, it just means that there are certain communities that are on fire. Um, and it's important to understand that, 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 that uh, national figures, whether law enforcement, I'm sorry, whether lawmakers or anybody else, really needs to um, to, to to stay focused on that that age old document called our Constitution, and give everybody that that uh, the same uh, uh, the same level of due process. Uh, I think at the end of the day, um, what I've been hearing is that the morale comes with morality. And if we can get back, bring back that level, that common level of morality, then the morale of our law enforcement um, will change and the, therefore the country will change as well. So anyway, with that, I wanna thank everybody for joining, uh, for joining me um, uh, for this Gold Institute. Uh, discussion regarding um, uh, what we see happening over the past uh, week, um, as well as um, over the past uh, months and uh, several years. Um, uh, again, again, I thank uh, uh, Congressman Trent Franks, a distinguished fellow at the Gold Institute, uh, Martin Johnson, a fellow at the a senior fellow at the Gold Institute, and uh, uh, Mark Black, a um, a, a good friend of the Institute and uh, a participant in several of our law enforcement projects. Um, with that, I thank you.